Actually, I'd like to do uh, two things today. One is to review the historical uh, evidence behind the treatment of the, this uh, terrible tumour, also to try and answer this question or to introduce the debate about whether we should biopsy or not, and then hopefully to walk slightly towards the uh, future about uh, investigational avenues. So um, two, three years ago, myself and colleagues in Toronto decided to critically appraise the literature um, because what we noted was that there were actually differing results being presented and possibly some of them suggested that there was benefit for certain treatment strategies, but we had concern that this could be explained possibly by the design and of the trials. So we actually uh, did a, s a systematic review and what we found over a 20-year period that there were 29 studies uh, which actually reported on over 900 patients. So there was certainly a, uh, a possibility to learn from quite a large number of patients. Uh, we felt that five of these st uh, studies did not have sufficient or quality data to assess. Um, they were dominated by US studies from uh, the old POG and CCG groups. Uh, and there were some European studies uh, also that we uh, were able to include in the analysis. The uh, mean number of patients per study was around uh, just over 30, but did range from 6 to 130. So we see actually there is a problem when we have some very small studies. And interestingly, there are some very large studies which, of course, uh, perhaps ethically uh, need to be looked at if uh, they're ineffectual in their treatment. Uh, 18 were completed in a three-year period. And interestingly, when we actually looked at the accrual rates, we found for group studies that there was a median accrual uh, rate per year of 17. Institutional studies, of course, are very tiny and only accrued three a year. The median age, we've already heard, uh, uh, was uh, as expected between 5 and 10, um, with the majority being between 6 and 8. Uh, the youngest patient included was 6 months. And uh, nine studies reported uh, disease in those under three. And I think uh, people subsequently have actually suggested there may be a better prognosis in this group. We were very, very keen to look at the assessment of eligibility. And not only did we have the published reports, but we actually uh, got all of the protocols and tried to make sure that people stuck to their original uh, uh, design. Twelve studies specified a maximum duration of symptoms and defined the symptoms that should occur. And uh, this uh, perhaps is very important. 13 studies reported on the duration of symptoms. Um, uh, seven enrolled uh, patients who had symptoms greater than six months, which many of us would uh, question as to whether that reflected a different biological process. But uh, the majority um, suggested that patients shouldn't have symptom duration of uh, less than six months, and in, and in two studies, in fact, less than three months. And as we've heard, the symptoms that uh, people defined were cranial nerve palsies, long tract and ataxia. Um, but actually only six studies had comparable data, and, and these were mainly uh, the POG studies, um, which meant that through the years, one could actually know the eligibility criteria remained stable. Uh, the imaging diagnosis, it was specified that it must be MRI 15, um, and some of the older studies, of course, uh, uh, allowed CT criteria, but we've heard about the uh, problems with that. And uh, 13 studies did not actually specify the extent of the pontine mass, which we believe was very important because we're talking about diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, not brainstem glioma here. Um, those that did uh, generally required that there had to be the majority of the pons occupied by the tumor, greater than 50%, two-thirds, or three-quarters. Um, no other study specified any other imaging criteria to uh, enroll these patients. Uh, it was centrally reviewed in 13 of 20 studies, uh, but the outcome was actually only reported in seven of those, and this is one of the uh, features that we found, that although the protocol said it was going to do something, this often wasn't actually reported. Um, of those where uh, there was actually uh, uh, reports uh, there generally was excellent agreement uh, uh, going with the classical um, uh, diagnosis of DIPG on MRI scanning with a 95% agreement. All studies uh, allowed biopsy proven high grade gliomas. And the reason why we raised this issue was that we felt that it may be that, in fact, those tumors that were actually biopsied were those that were more easily to be biopsied, which actually could reflect a different tumor. For instance, an exophytic tumor coming out as uh, presented by Ophelia that was high grade. Those may have a different outcome to, to true diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Uh, 
um, 249 patients were biopsied, which was uh, almost a quarter, and uh, 229 reported as being diagnostic, so actually quite a high diagnostic yield. Um, 76 samples were low grade but were included in the study. Generally speaking, uh, where reported, they were grade 2 tumours. Uh, we won't go through. The, this was um, obviously the details are in the paper, and uh, 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 we went through looking at the, uh, all aspects of trials, and the, these are actually available uh, to be re uh, reviewed. The response data is very important. 19 studies reported uh, response to radiotherapy, which was 700 registered patients, so a lot can be learned from this. Um, but in 125 patients, this was absent or incomplete. There was hyperfractionation versus conventional, um, and uh, uh, the response uh, data was, uh, was actually very similar, although there was a range. 11 studies reported clinical response, um, including uh, neurological or steroid use, and there was a clinical response in 85% of cases com uh, com uh, combined with a radiologic response of 50%, again il illustrating that the two do not always correlate and go together. Uh, but 46% of patients were saw on steroids after radiotherapy. One of our big issues is the definition of ra radiological response it was going to be used was unclear, and of course this is very important if one's going to try and compare trials. Um, so only one study looked at response in relation to survival, and there was no correlation in that study. Um, these are just some of the examples of response data for where, when given uh, for chemotherapy. And uh, essentially, uh, in the neoadjuvant setting, four studies presented response data. So 149 patients, 115 being a valuable, um, and uh, there were some non-valuable patients. Unfortunately, one has to conclude, as the authors did, that there's no survival benefit with chemotherapy from the data presented uh, in those studies that were clean. So with the 940 registered patients, uh, only 92 patients survived. Um, and uh, the, uh, the outcome, progression-free survival was reported as what, uh, first or second endpoint in 17 studies. Five studies, there was no definition of uh, the uh, progression-free survival endpoint. The 12 that did report this, um, Clinical progression was uh, taken as the primary endpoint in one study. Uh, most uh, studies uh, included some radiology definitions of a greater than 25% increase in size of the tumor, and uh, several studies tried to combine the two to get a clinical radiological progression. When we actually look overall, the progression-free survival was four to 8.8 .8 months with no improvement over time historically. The overall survival varied from 7 to 16 months. And of course, this, this is quite a large change, and it may suggest that a study actually was showing benefit, because it actually could look that you've doubled the overall survival. But when you actually only look at the studies that had strict eligibility criteria to actually focus on diffuse intrinsic quantum glioma, unfortunately, the overall si survival the range was much narrower, between 8 and 11 months. Um, and uh, uh, these are the Kaplan Meier estimates of one year survival for those studies that presented this, um, which unfortunately are very disappointing, as we know. So, what's the best endpoint to use? Um, the issue about progression free survival is that the, there appears to be a lack of agreement on the definition of progression. Um, if there was agreement, perhaps this could be used. Therefore, overall survival is obviously easier, but because possibly this could be affected by relapse therapy. So we wanted to look at this. 19 studies reported the time from progression to death. And actually, the range uh, uh, was 1 to 4.5 months. So this is actually fairly predictable. And it did rather suggest in the larger studies that unfortunately, whatever salvage treatment was offered, it did not particularly affect um, uh, the uh, length of uh, duration after the initial progression, which uh, may suggest that overall survival can be used. It was very common to have a lack of statistical endpoints in the protocols of these studies, and only uh, three studies really actually looked at trying to test at an early stage about nine-month survival. And again, this is important if we don't want to expose too many patients to an ineffectual treatment. So what was our uh, conclusions from this review? Well, uh, we felt that the design of studies was absolutely critical if we're going to move forward. Um, so new agents, with the, the thing that everybody's now looking at, of course, many of these may be cytostatic, so is response criteria relevant at all? Probably not. 
we need to have defined uh, PD endpoints, uh, therefore, if we're actually going to look at potential useful uh, new agents, which is important, whether these be surrogate or direct, uh, sorry, pharmacodynamic endpoints. And of course, we have to be realistic that there's probably unlikely to be a major, ch major change as a result of one additional agent. That's what history has shown us. And therefore, it's important that we actually do see where cytostatic agents may be beneficial for actually looking towards combination treatment. We have to be very aware that the difference in study design actually may mask small beneficial changes or indeed inflate the benefits of, of uh, uh, new treatments if the design is not consistent and aimed to exclude non-DIPG tumours. So how do we detect small survival changes? It remains a challenge, unfortunately, because we don't obviously want to uh, expose children to uh, treatments that are ineffectual. What is the best study endpoint? Well, um, overall survival is reliable, but uh, as we've uh, talked about, one mustn't exclude things such as quality of life as well. And of course, one of the big questions in this disease is can we ever randomize ethically? And it's very, very difficult, um, particularly uh, against the current standard, which is radiotherapy only. Um, and I'll li leave that um, as a basis, perhaps later on, that we can think when we think about common studies, at least we could be talking the same language when we uh, design our own protocols, hopefully, across the globe. So, to move on to uh, the next sort of controversial area in this disease, which is whether to biopsy or not to biopsy. As oncologists, we nearly always have a histopathological uh, uh, sample to actually direct our therapy, but not in this disease, generally speaking. And, uh, and uh, we've been looking at this, uh, along with others, is to uh, consider uh, why this is in this uh, modern era. And uh, not I ever want to uh, lay blame at anyone's uh, corner, but there was a series of discussion papers uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, the various groups, particularly in the States, uh, which led to a, uh, this uh, paper in 1993 where it was uh, said that in the new MRI era that was, um, that MRI scans should replace biopsies for the diagnosis of uh, diffuse brainstem gliomas. And this for, was for several reasons. The first was that when a biopsy was performed, it was small. Uh, obviously due to the sensitive nature of the area where the surgeons want to biopsy, and that this uh, had shown a poor diagnostic yield, and also due to possible heterogeneity of the tumor may not be representative. The second issue was about the safety for the individual child, that this could be a potentially dangerous procedure. And also that um, it did not appear to benefit the individual child because it very rarely altered the actual treatment that was offered. The children more or less got the same treatment anyway, so why, uh, why continue to do it? So the big question is, um, I think that had been accepted practice, and is it time to reconsider? And uh, I would suggest there are some reasons, but we have to move forward with caution. So the issue is small sample size and poor dog not poor diagnostic yield, being not represented in safety. Well, if one actually looks at more modern series of biopsies for this tumor, uh, you'll see that actually perhaps we've been unnecessarily uh, cautious. And, and these are um, just uh, four studies which actually um, uh, have been published in this more modern area of uh, neurosurgical technique. And actually for diagnostic yield, we actually see that nearly all of them obtained a diagnosis uh, um, in, well, particularly in pontine glioma, when you actually look at these papers and look at uh, those pontine tumors, actually 100% diagnosis was achieved in all of the studies. Um, it's not representative. Well, this is always difficult because what's the gold standard? We don't know. Um, because if pathology is not the gold standard, what is? Um, but actually, if you look at the spread of uh, glioma grades, we see that um, in these series, the majority of biopsies actually showed uh, a higher grade, a grade three or grade four tumor. Um, and if we look at the grade one tumors, which I think we would all agree we would not, uh, generally speaking, expect a DIPG to be, these were relatively low. The difficulty is, is um, uh, it, all of the data was not available in these papers to actually look at the imaging. And it may well be that, uh, in fact, uh, the neuroradiologist could have told you that this was a, uh, pon a, a, a juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma when the biopsy was performed. But um, there was a spread. Interestingly, when you actually look at other diagnoses, um, it, there were a few times that actually an alternate diagnosis was arrived at. Um, not either non-tumorous or occasionally 
um, uh, another type of tumour, and that may actually have altered their treatment. So perhaps occasionally there are patients who have been treated with possible radiological findings uh, suggestive of DIPG who, um, whose treatment could have been altered if a biopsy took place. What about safety? Well, um, in all of these series, no one died of their biopsy. There were no reported deaths. And actually, the morbidity, which tended to be transient, was actually also very low. And uh, generally speaking, uh, between 5 and 10% of patients may expect some transient increase in their signs, which usually is the exacerbation of a pre-existing symptom, such as cranial nerve palsy, that tended to return to normal after a short period of time. So actually, I think safety is less of an issue now. Um, the heterogeneity is very difficult, and uh, one, one study has actually uh, compared uh, how we use imaging to direct our biopsy, and uh, this actually looked at PET-directed biopsy sites, uh, either using FDG or methionine, uh, with MRI-directed di biopsy sites. It's a very small uh, study, but it's the only one that really compares this in children. There are only eight patients where actually uh, uh, both biopsies took place, which means that in the same child, a biopsy was based on best uh, estimate by using MRI control, and then an alternate pathway was actually used using PET-directed, so at the area of the most uh, active part of the tumour. And when that was actually done, and the co correlative biology, biology actually looked at, in fact, six out of eight patients were all upstaged. Actually, no one was downstaged, but it went from either uh, no tumour or uh, from a lower-grade tumour to a higher-grade tumour, which does actually suggest there is heterogeneity within the tumour type, according to the pathologist, because they get a small sample. And here you can see no diagnosis, and two patients turned to a GBM uh, when actually directed by PET and also grade two tumors uh, to a grade three or grade four tumor in three out of eight patients, again, on the basis of PET-directed biopsying. But what's, th if we don't, if we either agree or we don't agree that um, we need histopathological diagnosis to direct our treatment, what about the research value? Because we want to move forward in this disease. And of course, uh, most of us probably believe if we understand the biology better, we can design more clever and hopefully more effective treatments. So, what about the research value of biopsies? Well, there are some questions, and one can't assume that actually uh, going forward with stereotactic biopsies will provide the answer, because is there actually sufficient material for molecular analysis? It's very small, the material one gets. What about the actual quality of the material for looking at RNA and DNA and proteomics, et cetera? Um, is it of sufficient uh, quality and certainly standardized operating procedures for actually looking at this material? And again, what about the heterogeneity, not of the tumor, but of the target? So actually, we may believe that we think we have a good target, but of course, it may be that actually it's just available in hot spots of the tumor, and therefore, again, the heterogeneity aspect of this comes into play. And then, of course, what about the ethics of biopsy? And, and essentially, I think it boils down to this, which is this sort of seesaw that we have to look at, which is, if this was a totally safe procedure, we would do it. Why wouldn't we? Um, and, uh, you know, and if it had benefit for the child, you know, that actually definitely altered their treatment, we would do it, because we do it with every other type of tumour. But there's been some doubt cast on that. I've shown you a few studies that perhaps might be tilting uh, the seesaw. Um, but that's also balanced against altruism, by, by which I mean that if we want to move forward, and those that be, believe we need to understand the biology, we perhaps have to ask our partnerships with the families and with the children um, as to whether we can actually undertake as safely as possible, as efficiently as possible, a biopsy um, that may give us an answer, may uh, mean that we can move forward in this. And actually, there is perhaps sometimes a duty on us to actually think about the societal and the sort of bigger picture when we actually consider this. So no answers, um, but um, just a few thoughts. So to move on more to the future, what about investigation avenues in the UK? Well, all I'm going to do is just tell you about a couple of studies that uh, really have uh, been completed that we were looking at. And essentially, uh, I was involved with these, and, and one of the big issues we wanted to do was look at biopsy. And uh, with the European group, uh, uh, the ITCC, which is a drug development consortium, uh, we uh, wanted to look at targeted agents. But we felt that if we wanted to look at targeted agents, uh, 
we had to know if the target was present. And this was based uh, on Richard Gilbertson's work, and we were looking at epidermal growth factor receptor and the drug Tarceva. Um, so we took the perhaps bold decision that actually for that study we mandated biopsy uh, in order to uh, enter the trial, um, which I think might be the first time that anyone's ever done that, certainly uh, in a European basis. Um, but we were aware that actually this was a choice. Uh, certainly in the UK, we were very, very open with families and uh, they were aware of the potential risks of this and also the likelihood that this would not necessarily benefit their child a biopsy which meant that we also felt that we had to have an alternate strategy um, uh, for p uh, parents and families who did not want to actually enter on that trial. So these two trials were sort of run together. So the one that did not need biopsy, which may not be so exciting now, uh, was to actually look at the role of temozolamide um, in this disease. And of course, many of us were doing this at the same time. Uh, we did look at a slightly different schedule. And this is... Uh, uh, this is still ongoing, although it's nearly complete now. Um, so this was an alternative for families who did not want their child to go through a biopsy and allowed us to actually look at this. One of the big important things about this study was that we wanted to collect quite robust quality of life da uh, data because we felt the quality of life issue was very important and we wanted a baseline. Generally speaking, we know that temozolomide is well tolerated in other types of tumours and we felt that this would be a reasonable baseline to look at. The design is not particularly exciting. It follows more or less the Stupp uh, pattern with concomitant uh, temozolomide with radiotherapy at the start, followed by adjuvant. It does change here. We have been looking at the 21-day regime uh, every 28 days, so slightly more dose intense. And uh, this study is ongoing. Um, I suspect it will be similar to those reported. The alternate study um, is um, the... Uh, the biopsy mandatory uh, phase one study of Tarceva, uh, where we looked at this uh, with the ITC in refractory malignant brain tumors, uh, but also in newly diagnosed brainstem glioma. So a phase one study in this condition because we think it's so important that we move forward with new agents. And this is now complete. Um, it will be completely, and I think the final update given by my colleague, Bugi Giriga in ASCO, um, I've already sh uh, showed the data uh, in, in Chicago, ISMO, but just a reminder. Um, group two was the brainstem glioma uh, arm, and we were really looking for, uh, although we call it brainstem glioma, it was actually uh, designed to uh, be DIPG, and it was a lot of radiation therapy, newly diagnosed tumors. Uh, of course, we wanted to look at the pharmacokinetics and the biology on tumor material. Uh, these were dose-limiting toxicity, and one of the things we found, of course, doing a phase one study in this population meant you had to tease out when children had uh, events. Was it due to tumor progression? Was it due to radiation toxicity? What was it due to? And, of course, it's very difficult because one has to describe uh, potential causal um, uh, uh, causality to the new agent. And we certainly did run into problems in the relapse group with intertumoral hemorrhage and whether or not this agent was contributing to it. Uh, but actually, we did achieve a recommended phase two dose of 125 milligrams per meter squared. Tumor responses in group two, uh, we saw some, but remember they got radiotherapy. So, what was it due to? You know, and uh, again, uh, whether responses are important in this disease, we're not sure. Um, but uh, they're there uh, for everyone to see. This is probably the most important slide, and this shows. Uh, uh, I think this is fairly stable, um, a, a uh, median survival of 12 months, which is not particularly outside the range. Um, you know, it's towards the upper end of the range, but we certainly as a group have not uh, drawn anything uh, over-interpreted that at all. Um, now, uh, I'm going to show you some very preliminary slides, and actually perhaps um, the next slide shouldn't be uh, put on. Uh, the web um, um, until actually uh, the full, sli full slide and data is presented by Bugatti and ASCO. But we did want to obviously look at the biology. This is why we mandated the biopsy. And these are the studies that have been performed at the Institute Gustav Rossi. Um, obviously looking, focusing on EGFR expression, mutation, and possible predictive factors, including uh, co-activation of different pathways. And these were the grading system that the team there have used. And uh, Well, in fact, uh, what I'll do is just uh, actually talk around this slide then, just for your, uh, your eyes only, um, which is essentially, uh, this is the preliminary information. We hope this slide may have improved somewhat when it's actually shown. But what we wanted to show is 
the potential problematic aspect of actually receiving biopsies from different centres processed in a different way. And uh, although we have been able to get data, and I can tell you this has been improved upon since, you can see that there are problems with fixation. And it's very important if we want to use this that we have to think about the standard operating procedures, the recommendation that we have for uh, uh, getting the most out of these samples. And I suppose that's what I'd like to say is a, uh, a bit of a cautionary tale. And where are we now? Uh, well, uh, we're now considering our next trial. And also, very importantly, we're considering tissue collection strategy. Um, it's, uh, perhaps we'll talk later in the closed session about the particular agents we're looking at, um, but um, uh, of course we're, we're really now focusing on new agents, on potential new radio sensitizers, and on uh, targeted uh, drugs. The tissue collection strategy I think is incredibly important, and I'll be extremely interested to hear the experience of my uh, colleagues, particularly in relation to autopsy sampling, which I think is incredibly important from Alberto. And uh, that's, uh, that's an area I believe we have to focus on. And uh, certainly in the UK and in Europe, um, this is where we want to look at, because we want to collect as much of this data that's available on these precious samples and precious children, and actually have a uh, repository, essentially, where we can actually screen and look for new targets, because actually there's quite a lot of material and data already out there. Um, so I'll allude, um, I'm being a bit cautious because I've got various CDAs in place on discussions I'm having with pharmaceutical firms, et cetera, uh, but we'll certainly lead to that. And I think there are some very interesting potential targets that we can look at. But the design of studies, the issue of biology is paramount as to whether we can actually show whether those new agents are going to be effective or not. And this is definitely something that we have to do in partnership with the families and the children. Thank you. Hmm.